Hi guys, welcome to my channel. So, um, my name is Soraya and I am here to talk about limb girdle muscular dystrophy. To be specific about my story with limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2A. And if you want to hear my story, please stick around. So first things first, what is limb girdle muscular dystrophy? You would be asking yourself, right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm nervous. Anyways, it is a disability that is actually genetic. So it basically comes from, you know, your DNA. It's in your DNA and it comes from your parents. It doesn't necessarily mean that your parents have it, although there are some subtypes that um, their parents do have it and then they pass it down to their children um, but in this case in my story my parents don't have it like well they don't present symptoms but it is in their DNA and um, it was passed down to me I am the oldest of three siblings and I am the only one who actually has um, the gene from both my parents because in this case again I needed to get both the genes from both my parents in order for me to show symptoms and I guess I'm the lucky one um, <laughs> my brother and my sister they don't um, they haven't really figured out because there's a test that they can do to see if they even have the gene from one parent or none at all but um, I mean I am currently gonna be 28 and my brother is going to be 27 27 and my sister is 21 and no signs and so I just want to come on here and talk about it because it is a rare genetic disorder that isn't really well known of and there's many many stages to it I mean when you hear about someone with a disability you automatically want to think oh they're missing an arm or they're missing a leg or they're in a wheelchair or they're you know they're they're all constantly using a cane or something something that just you know you think of automatically when you hear a disability and limb girdle muscular dystrophy and many other kind of muscular dystrophies um you know there's different stages to it you don't automatically end up in a wheelchair some it's faster some it's slower again it goes with the with the description <laughs> of the disability it's degenerative so it slowly starts um, happening it slowly starts to take away the strength and the kind of limb girdle muscular dystrophy that I have it doesn't only take the strength away from my legs it takes the strength away from my arms as well well I want to start off my story because it's going to be multiple parts and I don't want this to be completely long. Um, I want to start off, I want to say high school, let's say 11th grade. So yeah, let's, let's go with 11th grade. So then 11th grade, uh, junior in high school, San Fernando High, shout out to the Tigers. If you're watching anybody, hi. Anyways, so I was completely healthy, you could say. Yeah, you could say healthy, absolutely nothing going on, just anxiety. Unfortunately, I have been dealing with anxiety for whew, since I was 14. No, other issues, probably I'll talk to you guys about it one day. Um, but besides that, absolutely nothing else was going on in my in with my health. Everything was peach perfect. Um chewing gum, sorry, it's unprofessional. <laughs> but it helps me with my nerves. Anyway, so yeah, eleventh grade completely healthy thank the thanks to the Lord and then that's when I did start to notice that what was getting hard for me to do was go up a set of stairs a flight of stairs or get up from a squatting position or you know when you lay down in the grass with your friends or on the floor anywhere and you have to get up uh, without holding on to anything like that was starting to get hard for me um, and I didn't know why and I never mentioned it to my doctors or I never mentioned it to my mom or anyone that was like, you know, an adult that I could have mentioned it to, unfortunately. Um, but I also think it was because it, it was affecting me, but not, 
not to the point where I was like, oh my God, what's going on with me? Probably something's wrong. So I let it go. Senior year, um, same thing. Like it didn't get worse senior year. It was pretty much the same as it was in 11th grade. So again, I didn't pay much attention to it. There was not much that I would be like, oh my God, this is happening to me and maybe this is wrong. Like there was just nothing that I could just say like there's completely something definitely wrong with me. I was just blaming it on probably being lazy or probably being too tired or the fact that I wasn't as active as I used to be in like ninth or 10th grade or my younger years, you know, in life. So I was just leaving it like that. Um, there is one story though that... I would like to mention I was in a sweet 16 and um, with a friend of mine um, and I was in her dance party like group and she had us you know there's this certain move at the beginning of the dance where she wanted us to be like down low and then get up real quick and it was like a constant thing that we had to do because we had to go you know practice multiple days out of the week and I felt like that was a great time for me because I was already feeling those symptoms. Um, but like I wasn't doing much about it or going to the doctor or asking. And then when she asked me to be part of it, I was like, oh, yeah, of course. Like I like to dance. I like to, you know, be with friends and everything. So um, I felt like, oh, and then it'll be a great thing to do because it'll keep me moving. Maybe it'll get me stronger with like more dancing and stuff. So I did notice that I, I, I was improving like with the days weren't by that we kept practicing i felt like i was getting better at it um so i was like oh maybe maybe that's all i need you know it's just to work out more to do strength training to be more active and, and do that uh, re repetitively until i get the strength back to do it like normally um but then that ended the sweet 16 you know we did it and everything and it started happening again like i started it started getting bad again to the point where now this time to go up a flight of stairs i felt like there was times mainly like in the afternoon of the day that i had to hold on to the railing in order to go up a flight of stairs because i felt like if i just did it by myself without holding on to nothing like i was gonna fall back i don't know why i, f I had that sensation so i would have to hold on to the railing not necessarily not necessarily to pull myself up but more to like keep myself steady so I don't fall back. And so that was like the main things that were happening to me um, in high school, mainly 11th and 12th grade. Uh, then I graduated and I attended Los Angeles Mission College. And the first semester was great, be technically because all the classes that I was taking were on the first floor, I think. Yeah, they were mainly all on the first floor. So I had no issues and the reality came to bite me in the ass when I actually in the second semester of college I was already married and I was living with my husband in a condominium and so in the condominium there was three floors the first floor was the garage and we had to take a flight of stairs up to the second floor which was the main living room area uh, you know living room dining room kitchen and a half bathroom and then from there we still had to take another flight of stairs to the actual bedrooms and that was in the condominium and so then at school the second semester I also ended up having a class one one of my classes was in the second floor and it, there was two flight of stairs that I had to take in order to go to the second floor and I was having issues at home going up the stairs and I was having issues at school but I felt them more in school because in school I had to um well, you know, in college or university, you have to, you know, get your books and books aren't light. They're pretty heavy. And so your books and your backpack and like if you have snacks, because if you had a long day in school, you know, just everything that you carry to school in general. And so that the stairs, the two flight of stairs in the school were getting really hard for me. Where, because you know, like like I said to you guys, I felt like I had to hold on to the railing or else I felt like I was going to fall back. So in school, like in one hand holding the books and then the other one holding the railing 
but the thing was that because I was holding the books I was adding more weight and sometimes I felt like I was gonna go more back and and not it wasn't only that at the, uh, at that point anymore it was also just hard like sometimes I did have to use my arm to lift me up to help me like go up the flight of stairs so I started noticing that and unfortunately not proud but instead of telling my husband or instead of telling my doctors or just my family in general someone who would listen to me and help me out with it I kept it to myself and my anxiety started coming back and just a lot of insecurities a lot of worries a lot of one of the biggest worries that I had was like okay this seems to be getting worse and you know you're already married so like just so 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 many thoughts started coming to my mind but one of the things that scared me the most to go to the doctor was like oh my god imagine that something is wrong with me and once you go to the doctor and they tell you what's wrong with you like there that's it it's over like you you've been diagnosed with something and I think that that was that wasn't where my mentality was at it wasn't the healthiest it wasn't the best I felt like if I went to a doctor and I found out something was wrong with me like I would just have a big downfall so I was avoiding it um another thing that I was really embarrassed of is because of that issue uh going up the two flight of stairs to my college class I ended up dropping the class and like completely failing that semester not all the classes but most of the classes especially that one because of that because slowly but surely um my anxiety was getting to me um more insecurities were starting to come upon me because of those issues and I wasn't speaking out about it I wasn't telling anybody I wasn't asking for help literally and I, now I look back and I think if I would have asked for help, that wouldn't have ever happened. I wouldn't have dropped. I wouldn't have failed so badly and have that on my record. But there's nothing I can do anymore. That is what happened. And all I can do is learn. <laughs> Sorry, that was the chair. It's not a fart. <laughs> okay, and so continuing on. Oof, let's see. So that was second semester of college. And all I ended up doing was telling my husband that college wasn't for me, but I didn't tell him the the real reason for it. I just was like, I made up a lie. Because, okay, so I was still able to hide it. Like at home, you know, just go up the flight of stairs and I would just say like, oh, I'm tired. I'm, I'm always tired. So that's why I would go slow, like in front of him. But um, there was times that I would still be able to like, you know, catch energy or feel like really, really good and like, go kind of faster up the flight of stairs so he wouldn't notice so I was keeping it from him like like how how bad it was like he knew like there were some struggles but he didn't know exactly how bad and mind you when I was younger I did have an accident that um, fortunately um, hurt my lower back so I always had like some pain and I used that as a great excuse as to why I would be so tired to go up the flight of stairs or or why sometimes I would go really slow or why sometimes I couldn't get up from a squatting position or from the floor, you know, sometimes I would ask him for a hand to help me up. And so that was like the perfect excuse, even with my with my parents, because they knew about the accident. Um and that kept going on, unfortunately again, for a couple of years until um, until I was like 25 yeah until I was 25 um, at that point I was thankfully able to apply for my residency and I was able to ha make a trip to Mexico to where I was born in Michoacan <laughs> to be specific it's um I was born in Zamora Michoacan but um, my parents there's from two little pueblos, um, I would say near Los Reyes, Michoacan. I don't know if you guys would know the name, so I'm just going to leave it like that. Um, and so it was my first trip after, at that point, 24 years that I had in the United States because I was brought over as a baby. I was one years old. And so it was my first time going. And 
I was so excited. I was super ecstatic because, you know, 24 years here and all these stories that you hear about Mexico. And I was just ready. I was so ready to finally be able to go, to finally be able to travel. And so I went with all these expectations and it wasn't, you know, my first trip, unfortunately, wasn't as magical as I wanted it to be. Um, one of the biggest things that I noticed was just, you know, that I wasn't able to hide or to disguise my disability um, in any way, shape, or form like I did here. In the United States, um, disclaimer, we still have a lot to improve in, but it is, it is much better for a person with disability to live here than it is to live in a country like Mexico. Well, Namely, to, I could just only speak about the places that I visited when I was there because the way that um, that the houses were made, that the stairs that um, that I had to that I encountered were made, um, that the pavement, the sidewalks, everything that that I encountered, unfortunately, there's something that I, I used to describe it. It's a word in Spanish called Mickey Mouse. You know, it's just like oh, just just do a flight of stairs and they don't really take measurements and just do, you know, whatever. <laughs> Some, um, sidewalks, you had to go up a, a big old step, like 12 inches or more higher in order to get on the sidewalk. And some stairs were like made all crooked or if there even was a ramp, it was a steep, steep, steep ramp that like there was just no way you could like go through the ramp easily. You know, even for an able-bodied person. So, there was just no way for me to hide it or to disguise it that I was okay. Because I needed help everywhere I went. Literally everywhere I went. And so, my husband, he started to realize, like, oh my gosh, you, you need a lot of help. And I was like, yeah. But I didn't want to look into it still in denial in my head and the one person that i was not able to completely hide it from was my grandmother she insisted that i my paternal grandmother um she insisted that i go to the doctor and she had me go to the doctor in samora and that doctor he wanted me to basically he did a couple tests on me he just wanted to check like my strength like from my arms and from my legs and he also made me squat and show them how I got up he made me sit on the floor and then he asked me like with nothing around me he made me sit on the floor like crisscross applesauce and I could sit on the floor at that time I could I could go down safely and sit down and you know make it look easy but then he's like okay now I want you to get up and when he told me to get up I couldn't at all because here in the United States when I would wherever I would sit I would make sure that either well obviously if my husband was there he I would ask him for help or if he wasn't there and I was with family like I would make sure I would sit like near a sofa near a chair near a desk near a table anything that I could then put my like my arms on and help me push myself up if there was nothing around me then I could not get up. There was no way. My legs wouldn't do it. And so when he asked me that, mind you, my husband and my grandmother were both in the room along with the doctor. And I just looked up at my husband and then I looked up at my grandma and the doctor then said again, like, get up, show me. And I had never cried like this in my life until that day. I literally just started bursting out into tears and looking at my husband and my grandmother was just like, like, what's going on? Why are you crying? Why don't you get up? And that's when I told her, I, I can't. So the doctor told my husband to get me up to help me and he helped me too, the doctor and my husband. And like he told them to, you know, go outside and wait for me and I changed and everything. And I went outside to the little consultation desk with the doctor and my husband and my grandmother and he just looked at me and he didn't say much 
he was just like, don't cry, you know, we're going to figure this out. Um, there's a great neurologist that I want you to see. She's uh, uh, down the street here, but you're going to have to call her and have to come back because I'm pretty sure she's not going to have appointments today. So we went back to the Pueblo where my grandmother's from. And that night, like my grandmother is a very strong woman who with little words and is also a person that shows almost little to no emotion. So she didn't say much about it. She just said, we have to make sure you go to the doctor and we have to talk to your parents about this. And we just got to figure something out for you because I don't want you to be dragging yourself on the floor later on. Those were her words. That was it. So what I did was go back with my husband. That was a couple of days after having landed in Mexico. I went back to the room with my husband and I just, I cried. I cried because I had to face reality now. Like there was no more hiding it. I had to do it. Like there, I couldn't go back. Like I owed it to, to everybody and I owed it to myself to continue the process, to continue going to the doctor and to figuring out and getting to the bottom of what was going on with me. You know, there was no more hiding, no more denying, no more just putting it to the side. It had to be looked at. And so I honestly, all I wanted to do was come back because that was basically putting this whole like veil of sadness over my first trip to Mexico, which I was really excited about. So the next day came. And I did call the doctor, but she couldn't see me until like a couple of days later. So it was like the second week that I was already in Mexico. And my cousins um, ended up taking me back to Zamora and I saw that doctor. And as soon as um, I walked in, she had me do a couple of strength tests. And then she had me sit down, you know, to ask me a couple questions. But she was basically like watching me, like my every movement the whole time that I was there. And then when I got up from the chair, usually what I would do is just like with one hand, like push myself from the desk, like whatever was in front of me, which was usually a desk or a table. So I would push and I would easily get up. But she she took that and me walking there and just everything that she had done before she had me stand up from the chair. And she said, I think that you have dystrophia muscular de cinturas, which is which translates to limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And I told her, oh, so then that's what I have. And my new doctors in Mexico do not sugarcoat anything. She said it very bluntly with a raised voice. She's like, that, I did not say that that is what you have. I said that that is what I think you have. There is a difference. And then I was just taken aback because at the moment she said dystrophia, which is dystrophy, my mind literally just went to I don't know why my brain connected dystrophy to deformed. And um I I just I couldn't get that word out of my out of my head. I couldn't like the images that crossed me, like the possible futures I had that crossed my head in that in that single moment, like we're just ugh, I don't even want to think about it. But um after she said that, I, I wanted to know more about it, like what was her definition, although she said that that, she, although she admitted to me that that was not what I have, but what she thinks that I have. But I just wanted to know more, and the things she was saying were just scaring me, you know, because I had never heard of it before. I had never seen it before. Mind you, again, it is a rare disorder. And so she ended up doing, the last test that she ended up doing was EMG. And one second. The thing that she ended up doing to me was an EMG, which is uh, electromyography, which is a test that measures muscle response or electrical activity in response to nerves stimulation of the muscle. So if I find a picture, I'll post it up just so you guys could see. Um, I think there's a picture um, that my husband took where she was doing it to me specifically on my back, which is basically just this like little needle that you inject to like the muscle like to where it touches the actual muscle and then through the wires connected to the machine it sends like this little shock wave that tests the activity of that muscle to see how strong it is or if it's working properly or well yeah you know basically that and so um 
that was a very long test mind you she did it from literally from my head to the toes like injected needles in my head to check my muscles here to check my muscles in my neck my back my arms my feet my butt everything you could think of she poked <laughs> she did that and it was painful after a couple minutes you just have you can't have enough because it's a little literal shock to your muscle and so after she did that test she again repeated her words bluntly i think that you do have muscular dystrophy um and i would need you i would recommend you to a doctor in mexico city um that they have this great program with specific with neurologists that's um uh, with brain fart with neurologists that work specifically with this type of muscular dystrophy and so i would recommend you to go she asked me you know how much more longer was i going to be in mexico and that was my last week and she says well if you could figure out a way to stay that would be great so that was my biggest that was the next step for me to do but unfortunately step of the process that i was to get my residency I had only a permit to go to Mexico for two weeks and if I stayed more than the two weeks and didn't come back I was gonna be denied reentry so I could not extend my stay I just could not so we went back to the pueblo my husband and I we mentioned what the doctor said to my grandmother we called my parents and everything and um, there was like again I said like with UC USCIS there was not much I could do I could not you know in such short notice get an extension to stay so I had to come back that's the story does not end there there is many more things that happen but I feel like if I continue for now it would be way 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 too long and I mean mind you it's like 30 minutes already I think so um if you guys would like to continue hearing my story, I would really appreciate it. Um, if you guys want to leave down a comment below, I will be posting a second and maybe even a third part. Um, again, this is the girdle muscular dystrophy 2A that I have and this is my story based on that. And even with that specific limb girdle muscular dystrophy, there is not every person experiences the same way or the same symptoms or the same progress of it so don't take my word for absolutely everything this is just my story but if you guys would like to know about more stories i will leave multiple links down below of websites um instagrams and just accounts that you guys can follow to get more information or find more uh people that are telling their story out there and I will also leave the link to my Instagram down below if you guys would like to follow me. I post more constantly there. Um, and I'm going to try to post more constantly there now. And I would really appreciate your guys' um, support. Because I do want to spread awareness about this um, disability. And I would really, 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 really appreciate your guys' support. Thank you.